I'm going to be provocative, but um, perhaps not in the way that some of you are expecting. I'm going to start by telling you that I, I'm not against testing in all forms, uh, but I am against certain combinations of policies uh, that restrict teachers' ability to, uh, to do their job and to do it well, and in some ways constitute a kind of deprofessionalization of the teaching profession. Uh, and, and I wouldn't want to call for uh, a, the professionalization. Is it clear enough? OK. Um, oh, yeah, sure. And uh, so what I am going to do is call attention to um, certain policies in various U.S. states and some Canadian provinces, um, and really worldwide this applies, that are having a massive uh, and I think in some part detrimental effect on education. And we'll also talk about possibilities uh, for change and, and harnessing the best of the things that we are doing. Nova Scotia in particular is a very interesting case in terms of citizenship education, and I hope we get to discuss that because uh, in some ways the province is actually a pioneer and a lot of the things that, that I would suggest. Um, let me start with this thought experiment, okay? Imagine for a second that you were blindfolded, taken away from this room right here, and brought somewhere up into space and somewhere back down somewhere in the world and plopped into a classroom in some country somewhere in the world. Okay. Now let's pretend, since this is a fantasy experiment anyway, that uh, you know, you, you, language is not a problem, that cultural differences are, don't key you in. And here's my question. The blindfold's taken off. You start observing the lesson going on. Would you be able to tell whether you had been dropped in a classroom in a democratic nation, like Canada, the, U, the US now anyway, um, and, uh, uh, or, or a totalitarian nation, say China, Syria, Iran? Think about that for a second. Would you be able to tell whether you were put in a classroom in a democratic nation or a totalitarian one? I don't ask this question facetiously, right? It seems plausible, for example, that a lesson in fractions, right, or in a foreign language, or in literature, uh, quite possibly could be very similar in classroom, whether you're in a totalitarian nation or a democratic one perhaps with some adjustment for cultural relevance and so forth, right? But if you stepped into a school and asked to observe a lesson related to the country's political ideals about governance or civic or political participation, would you be able to tell which kind of country you were in? I ask this because I think that most of us would like to believe that we could. While schools in North Korea or China or Iran, for example, might be teaching students blind allegiance to the nation's leaders and deference to the social and political policies those leaders enact, we'd expect that schools in the United States or Canada uh, or other democratic nations would want to teach schools the kind of skills and dispositions they need to function in a democratic society. And that means to be able to participate and take part in the civic affairs, including being able to critically evaluate policies uh, being put forth, right? Because that's what democratic citizenship requires. So while we wouldn't be surprised, let's say, to find that um, Kim Jong-il of, uh, of North Korea um, hands down a kind of official curriculum uh, that tells an official history right, uh, about the single party authoritarian regime. Um, we wouldn't be surprised to find that. In fact, a, a kind of one version of truth or one version of history is really one of the hallmarks of a totalitarian society, right? That's how uh, it's almost uh, defined in some sense. But democratic citizens um, might need to be committed to the people, the principles, and the values that underlie democracy. Things like political participation, free speech, civil liberties, and social equalities. So schools might develop these commitments through lessons in the skills of analysis and exploration, free political expression, and independent thought. Um, and yet, my thought experiment still stands, right? And let's carry that through this evening. Uh, if you were observing these lessons, what would be different in these two countries? Let me ask one other thing before I continue. Uh, if I asked you, uh, what do uh, parents in Canada and the United States most want for their children? When you ask them that, what are some of the top three answers that they, they want for their children? Let me just ask you, what do you think some of the answers are? 
Sorry? <laughs> happy, to be happy. Anything else? A good education. A couple more? Yell it out. Safe. They want them to be safe. Yeah. Healthy. Absolutely. Okay. All of those things, in fact, are in the long list. But uh, Penny actually got the first one. And the very first thing that parents say they want their, their children to be is happy. Okay. Another one that they want is to be in loving relationships, right? to be in healthy relationships. And of course, they want them to be gainfully employed and well educated. Okay. Um, and they want them to have good judgment. Right, to be able to think. But when you look at school goals in virtually every Canadian province and every US state, they go something more or less like this. Prepare students for the 21st century, whatever that means, I've never been quite sure. Um, teach excellence in math and science and reading. And teach good citizenship, by which if you dig uh, scratch belief beneath the surface, they most often mean obeying rules and listening to your teachers and parents. Right? So why this mismatch? Of course, one reason is we didn't ask parents necessarily what do we want your kids to learn at school, but what you want from your, for your kids, right? But we also know that students, uh, children spend a vast majority of their time in school. They'll spend far more time with their teachers than with their parents um, during the 18 years that they are growing up. So, it seems reasonable to ask why the mismatch, right? Parents talk about uh, the whole student, and schools often, but not in Nova Scotia, of course, um, respond with school goals and curriculum reforms that are very specialized, explicitly individualistic, and what some might call um, narrow, narrow, narrow. Susan Ohanian, who's a teacher in Massachusetts, uh, says that school reform is global, grandiose, and gutless. And what she means by that is that school reform rarely addresses directly what teachers care about teaching and what parents uh, and students care about learning. It's lofty. It has uh, sort of aphorisms that we can all agree on, but it's often without content and without meaning. Now, we all want students to learn to read and write, right? There's nobody in this room uh, who doesn't have that uh, as a goal or, and to add numbers, right? I don't think anyone here, in fact, is part of a group called um, Educators Against Students Knowing How to Read or Against Them Knowing How to Add Numbers, right? There is no such group. And so it's a straw man argument to say, uh, Oh, those, you know, those other, the, those other educators or those parents, they, you know, they don't want their kids to know any facts. They don't want them to learn anything. They just want them to feel good, right? There is no such advocacy group. Everyone wants kids to know how to, how to read. Everyone wants kids to know how to compare prices in a supermarket. But there are a growing number of educators, parents, and students themselves who feel like that's not enough. You need to know that, but for a democratic society, you need to know more. Right? And, uh, you need to be able to read, sure, but you also need to be able to discern what's worth reading right? and why someone wrote it and for what purpose and from where they're coming from. Um, you need to add numbers, sure, but am I doing anything wrong or is that okay? Um, you, you need to be able to add numbers, absolutely, but you also need to understand the differences in food prices in, di in different uh, class neighborhoods, uh, why there are uh, X number of liquor stores in certain neighborhoods and why there are X number of ammunition stores in others. That would be for the US, of course, not in Canada. We never use guns here. Um, but uh, uh, so uh, really, everyone wants the basics, okay? But some people talk about something that's more than the basics. And so one argument, of course, is that, well, we have to do the basics before we can do anything. Uh, unfortunately, what I'm going to try and argue is that when we focus on that as the exclusive goal, we push to the side many uh, goals that are critically important in educating democratic citizens. Um, let me. Uh, and in that sense, these are difficult times for education reform. Okay. Uh, although parents and teachers say they want kids to be happy, many education policymakers seem mostly focused on making sure that kids are tested. So some people call no child left behind uh, the no child left untested uh, thing. Other teachers I've heard call it no child left, which is another one. But let me just um, give you an aside here. I was um, looking on the web the other day, and there's a, a, a how many people here are from Ottawa? A few? Okay me. Um, 
the, uh, there's a program in Ottawa called the Ottawa School Breakfast Program, which is a fantastic program, wonderful people working there. They serve breakfast to some 8,000 uh, Ottawa children who come to school uh, hungry without enough to eat. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a terrific program and it accomplishes a lot. But on their website, they have a question and answer, you know, a Q and A. And uh, one of the very, the question number two on their website is, why is it important to feed children who are hungry? Okay, and I'm gonna read you the answer that's on the website. Children who arrive at school hungry do not perform well in the classroom. Numerous studies have shown that students who are fed are more alert, develop great, greater self-esteem, have better attendance and fewer discipline problems. Children who receive a healthy, nutritious head start to the day show a marked improvement in academic achievement. Okay, now, Gosh, I mean, it, it wouldn't be enough to just feed them because they're hungry, right? I mean, have to, I mean, the kids are coming to school hungry and we give them food. Seems like a lofty enough goal. And of course, this, is, this answer is not uh, an indictment of the people who run the program. What it's showing is the, the lengths to which, to almost an absurd degree, that we have to go to justify educational programs in terms of raising test scores, right? God forbid we should just feed the kids even if they don't get their test scores raised. Not only that, there seems to be research going on here, right? They said that kids who learn, research shows that kids who learn, uh, who, who are fed in the morning, perform better on the test than kids who are hungry. I'm, I'm really wondering about the control group in this study, right? <laughs> they, oh, you guys, you can't eat. I mean, they starve them for three days, but um, I guess it's all in the, in the name of science, right? Uh, but the instrumental nature of those goals is what I'm talking about, and, and uh, the, the need to justify everything in terms of raising test scores um, pushes certain things to the size of the curriculum. This is an extreme example, but it happens again and again in all kinds of forms of education reform. But it's not just that test preparation is taking away time from other kinds of meaningful activities. It's also about the tendency of these reforms to sap what's most important about learning. And it's the reason that really we do it all, and that is teaching kids how to think for themselves, uh, and thus the, the attack on critical thinking. The relentless focus on testing at times means that time for in-depth critical analysis of ideas uh, gets reduced to near nothing. There's a saying among teachers, some of you probably know it, everyone likes to teach critical thinking, but nobody likes a classroom full of critical thinkers, right? Don't ask too many questions. Um, and it seems to me that uh, too many school policies right now are taking that saying uh, to an extreme. In the past eight years in particular, hundreds of schools, districts, states, and provinces have enacted policies that seek to restrict critical analysis of historical and contemporary events in the school curriculum. And in the process, democratic thinking has been threatened, which imperils not only teachers' independence to teach in the way that they see most fit, but also students' preparation for democratic citizenship. Uh, I, let me give you a few examples on the ground, okay? Um, Brampton, Ontario. Student was suspended because he had posted flyers about a student protest against Canadian involvement in Afghanistan. In Vancouver, British Columbia, a teacher was disciplined for allowing students to write poetry about their relationship to Canada. The problem was that some of the students wrote about their experiences of racism in Canada, and they read these at a school assembly, and some parents complained. Uh, if we go uh, down to the U.S., in New Mexico, five teachers were suspended a few years ago for uh, so either suspended or disciplined for promoting discussion among students about the Iraq war and U.S. involvement in the Iraq war. There's one in particular I just want to tell you about was Alan Cooper. And Alan was a teacher in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, who did this terrific two-week curriculum where he asked students to bring in newspaper articles from all around the world, which is something that most of us couldn't have done when we were in school, right? But now with the web, you can. Uh, and to get different perspectives on what was going on in the war in Iraq. And his students did that and they studied this issue for two weeks. And the culmination of this curriculum was that he asked the students to develop posters, design posters, uh, expressing some of their opinions and what they've learned from all of these things. And some students did um, you know, big anti-war posters and some students did pro-war posters that it was so important for the US to be involved. And some did pros and cons and they said, I, it's too complicated, you know, we don't know, but um, here are some of the issues we discovered. 
Well, he had these um, posters on, up on the classroom wall for two days, and the principal came in and said, Alan, you have to take this poster, this poster, and this poster down. And Alan Cooper said, why? Why those posters? And the principal said, this is uh, as, as told me by a reporter, the principal said, um, well, they're not uh, pro-war enough. Okay. Now, this is a school where students uh, are monthly writing letters to uh, the soldiers in Iraq. Um, there's a huge American flag in the lobby of the school. There's all kinds of, there's military recruitment going on at the school, um, something that we'll talk about because that's a big issue now in Nova Scotia. Um, and uh, and it, in other words, there were a lot of, of uh, activities related to supporting uh, U.S. involvement in the war, per se, um, but not that. Um, What's interesting, and then I could tell you many more stories like this, of both students and teachers. Um, in West Virginia, for example, there was a high school student, Katie Sierra, um, who was suspended for distributing leaflets, inviting students to join an anti-war club. Um, and uh, Katie's peers, some of the students, threatened her with what they said was West Virginia justice. Um, and Katie was suspended, but not those other students. And in fact, she missed her school uh, uh, um, graduation, even though she was an A student, um, because of the suspension. Now, a lot of these cases, almost all of them, are, uh, were taken up by the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, the ones in Canada were often also, usually didn't have to go to court. They were immediately um, rescinded and, and so forth. But you can imagine the chill factor. The ACLU usually wins these cases. But you can imagine the chill factor that settles on teachers and students who might not have the fortitude or the ability um, to stand up, for example, like Alan Cooper did, who he refused to take them down, uh, the posters down, and he, and he was suspended. Um, one last example, in Broomfield, Colorado, uh, David Dial, who is 17 years old, was suspended also for posting flyers, and um, more importantly, um, his friend, Timothy Geis, was suspended for wearing a t-shirt to school with the quote by that well-known radical Albert Einstein, um, a, an anti-war quotation, and, and Timothy refused to take the t-shirt off when the principal asked him to do so, and he was, and he was sent home. Okay? Um, since 9-11 in particular, um, more and more teachers and students are seeing their schools or entire districts and states limiting their ability to explore multiple perspectives on a number of issues in foreign affairs and in other uh, controversial issues as well. Um, more recently, students in uh, Connecticut put together a play from soldiers' own words, experiences in Iraq, only from the soldiers' words. It was called Voices in Conflict, and the school um, forbid them from performing this play. This story has an interesting ending because uh, the students went on to perform this play off-Broadway to critical acclaim and, uh, and, and so forth. Um, you can see I have more examples from the U.S. There are fewer but significant examples in Canada, uh, and the trend is, uh, is related, although not as, not as severe. Um, one of the ways that we see things happening in Canada is, is that uh, seven provinces are now incorporating massive character education um, plans as the primary approach to teaching citizenship education to the exclusion of other possible citizenship education curricula. And uh, we'll, we can talk more about character education in the discussion. Um, it's a noble enterprise with good goals, but it often is reduced to um, following rules and uh, obeying uh, laws, obeying the teacher, and so forth. Something that we can certainly all agree our students should do, but might not be enough in a democratic society, right? Think again uh, about character education in this classroom you land in and whether you would be able to tell if you were in a democratic uh, society. I'm going to give one last example because everyone likes a things are worse um, south of the border example, and I can do this because I'm from New York. So let me tell you, in case you haven't heard about it already, that in Florida, schools have made critical thinking um, pretty much illegal. Um, the 2006 Florida Education Omnibus Bill includes language that specifies the following. The history of the United States shall be taught as genuine history. American history shall be viewed as factual, not as constructed, shall be viewed as knowable, teachable, and testable. History lessons should not be open to interpretation. So Florida really is the first state to ban critical thinking outright. Now, uh, in some ways, it's easy to dismiss the whole state. I don't know. We can, you know, Jeb Bush, governor of, uh, is, is the governor, uh, brother of W. Um, but, but still, it, 
it, uh, it seems significant. Now, historians, of course, you know, almost universally regard history as simply a matter of interpretation. And in fact, it's what makes history so interesting. Um, it doesn't mean there are no facts, right? Uh, we can all agree that the Normandy invasion was in 1066 and not 1067. Um, there are facts that everyone can agree on, but how, which facts you choose and how you put those facts together to tell a story is what makes history um, both uh, kind of uh, reliable competing sources of information, and also so interesting, which is especially important to us educators, because pedagogically, if you reduce history to a telling of facts, that's where we, you know, get to uh, Ferris Bueller's day off, you know, that anyone, anyone, because um, nobody cares about those facts, right? What people care about is how those facts are put together and the controversy. Um, so there are many examples like this. There's a recent study uh, that looked at school boards in Canada and school districts in the United States and found that uh, upwards of 70% of them had uh, cut back time in subjects not related to, prepar to test preparation, so in every subject other than math uh, liter and literacy, um, to make time for preparation for these tests. Some of the first to go, of course, are arts. Um, the close behind are, hist are, are civics, uh, citizenship education, and history entirely um, from, from this. And not only that, it's disproportionate how this is spread out. In other words, which students get to take history depends on their test scores. So sometimes you have whole classes of students who didn't perform highly enough on certain tests, so they're banned from taking other courses that certain students would take. And so then we create uh, a class gap in who gets to learn about history uh, and who doesn't. Um, I, I'm focusing on history here, but I have to say the trend is not limited to social studies. In many school boards, virtually every subject is under scrutiny for deviation from this kind of single narrative based on knowable, testable, and purportedly uncontested facts. Um, an English teacher in an urban high school uh, told me that even novel reading was now prescripted in her province's rubric, meaning uh, meanings were predetermined, vocabulary words pre-selected, and essay topics pre-digested. And an American science teacher uh, put it this way to me. He said, the only part of the science curriculum now being critically analyzed is evolution. Right? So, <laughs> um, so as I said, this relentless focus on testing pushes away time for in-depth analysis of ideas. And, and that is where uh, I find the threat to democratic participation um, a, a concern of mine. Uh, the hidden curriculum, in some sense, of post uh, no child left behind policies is how to please authority and pass the tests, not how to develop convictions and stand up for them. Uh, some people might see the, in, in the United States, see NCLB as the spiritual sister of the Patriot Act, which, right, which had key provisions um, re just recently reauthorized, uh, because the Patriot Act had all the, the kind of background of it of don't ask questions. You remember Ari Fleischer's comments. Um, and, and some people see the curriculum, the school curriculum, as an unwitting reflection of that kind of thinking. Uh, in fact, I want to just mention that there's a psychiatric disorder that probably some of you are familiar with. Um, it's called ODD. You know this? What, is, what does ODD stand for? Yeah. Oppositional, oppositional defiant disorder, okay? Now, I am not a psychiatrist, I am not a doctor, and I'm, I'm not even a psychologist, um, so I, I'm, I'm not arguing that there is no such condition or that there aren't children who can benefit from behavioral or medical uh, intervention um, for such a disorder. There probably are children who are impossible in this regard. However, um, there's very little empirical research on this, but the evidence that we do have shows that the rates of diagnosis of ODD in the last 10 or 15 years has increased from somewhere between 1 and 2 percent of the student population to, in some school boards, as high as 18 or 20 percent okay, in the last 15 years. Um, as some of you know, it's a disease characterized by a set of symptoms that include things like argues with adults or defies rules. Okay? Um, there's an Oregon educator, Norman Diamond, uh, who decided that he had seen an epidemic of a different disease and he needed a word for it. So he was going to coin this new disease and he called it CAD, which was Compliance Acquiescent Disorder. <laughs> 
and he took an ad out in the paper asking for subjects for his, uh, for his study that he wanted to do on this disease. And he said, this is when a student defers to authority, reflexively obeys rules, believes the commercial media, fails to argue back, and stays restrained when outrage is warranted. Right? Now, Norm uh, Diamond was, is, is joking, of course, and poking fun at the increasing prevalence of ODD. But really, when you think about it, I suspect, from what I see around, is if we did an inventory for CAD, we would probably find a virtual epidemic. Right? We are increasingly surrounded by people all around us uh, who fail to be outraged by outrageous things um, and don't want to do anything about it. And that would fit into his category of compliance acquiescence disorder. Now, I don't want to get uh, too depressing, okay? So, so far I've been uh, pointing fingers at all these policies and everything. I want to spend the remainder of my time talking about the possibilities, okay? Um, Ontario, Nova Scotia, all the provinces, and most U.S. states are filled with teachers doing amazing things despite the current direction of certain aspects of school reform. And make no mistake, um, teachers have awesome power in this regard. Uh, I, I want to tell a quick personal story because I'm from New York and uh, I, was, I lived in New York uh, during September 11th, 2001, uh, attacks on the World Trade Center. Uh, in fact, my wife and I were bringing my daughter uh, to her daycare and we had just dropped her off and we saw that people were collected on corners and when we looked up, we, we saw that one of the towers was on fire <coughs> and we actually stood there uh, and watched as the second plane um, hit the South Tower, and we were about mm, a mile and a half away, uh, and we, by that time, had run to get our daughter from her daycare, and the three of us, luckily, she didn't watch too closely. She was quite young, um, but the three of us watched as both, uh, both towers collapsed into those impossibly dense um, Wall Street streets, and uh, I, I remember actually thinking that um, you, you know, I wasn't thinking about the people in the tower as much as the people in that area there, because I was so familiar with the dense uh, population. I just thought it's impossible, like those buildings can't possibly collapse into that, those streets. Um, and it wasn't long before, I, I mean, it's hard to describe the kind of shock, it was silence. I mean, when the, when the, the buildings collapsed. It was hard to take in as real. I mean, it looked like some kind of movie. I mean, I'm sure you've seen the, the, the video footage of it, but when you were there. Um, and it wasn't long before people started arriving at our street corner who had actually been there, because people started to flood uptown. And uh, eventually there were, um, there were uh, stories of gas leaks and possible explosions, um, which turned out not to be true, but we decided we should leave. And we went to get our bicycles and pedaled uptown to where, where my mother lives on the northern um, tip of Manhattan. And that's where we spent the last, the, the next three days, the following three days, kind of living outside, meeting with people in cafes and restaurants and, and talking about the, you know, this unthinkable um, event. But the reason I'm telling you this story is uh, that what people don't often think about is the fact that while all this was going on, um, there were thousands of school teachers with thousands of children uh, in lower Manhattan at this very time. And remember, this is September 11th, right? So this is the very first few days of school. Um, and they had this awesome responsibility for uh, for the students there. And teachers did all kinds of different things. Some had the kids sing songs. Um, some, you know, lined them up and, and got them ready to go. Uh, there was a lot of chaos, of course. Nobody knew what was going on. Some of these schools were right under where the towers were collapsing. And I've been reading uh, this book called Forever After, which is stories, teachers' stories of 9-11. Uh, of and uh, one of the teachers in this book, Patricia Lent, um, taught at PS 234, which was right under one of the collapsing towers. These were the kids who saw people jumping out of the towers and debris fell on this school. Well, she just grabbed her students um, and ran uptown. And, uh, and they got to this other school, PS 41, where they spent the next few months. And uh, she, not one of her students was, was hurt or, or harmed. <clears throat> and uh, a few months after the attacks, Patricia asked her students what they remembered from that, that horrible day. And, uh, and one eight-year-old boy 
uh, said to Patricia, what I remember most is that you held my hand and never let go. And I, I, when I read that, I, you know, it, it reminded me of the awesome power and the kinds of impacts that teachers and educators have on children's lives that we can't begin to know. Um, now, hopefully none of us will ever be in a situation like that or as dramatic, but it highlights the kind of power to form for good and for bad, despite whatever uh, education reform is going on at the moment, the power that teachers have um, with their students. I often ask my students at the university to recall their best and worst experiences from their schooling. And it's amazing because these are kids in their 20s, sometimes they're second career people, um, sometimes they're older than me, and people always bring examples from, you know, third, grade three, from kindergarten, from grade four, from grade five, grade two. Um, these experiences that stayed with them uh, for their entire lives. And, um, Teachers have this awesome responsibility, right, for students. Uh, it's powerful, and, uh, and basically, we as educators are the bearers of that power. Uh, Adrian Rich has written that, that poetry begins in terror and ends in possibility, and I suspect it's often the same with education, right? Children can and are deeply affected in wonderfully positive ways by teachers who challenge them to think using any means at their disposal, and there are many teachers doing those kinds of challenging curriculum. Um, before I close, I'll, I'll give an example, a, a teacher in Ottawa who takes her students to the exit of the Canadian War Museum uh, in Ottawa, uh, which some of you I'm sure have seen. Uh, and that museum is very interesting, especially for me coming from the United States. Uh, it's, it's really dedicated to a critical history of war and it has its own share of controversies with it. But at the end of the museum, after you go through, there's an inscription and the inscription says this, history is yours to make. It is not owned or written by someone else for you to learn. History is not just the story you read, it's the one you write. It's the one you remember or denounce or relate to others. It's not predetermined. Every action, every decision, however small, is relevant to its course. History is filled with horror and replete with hope. You shape the balance. I suspect that if we go back to that, that trip around the world and we had a teacher reading that inscription and discussing it with students, that would be one sure sign that you were in a democratic nation, okay? Asking students to partake in their own sense of shaping history uh, and critically analyzing the policies and the goings on um, is something that is a quintessentially democratic idea. Uh, and I suspect that we could, many of us here could imagine beginning a lesson with just such, this, the, uh, such a quotation. Maxine Green says the purpose of education is to comfort the troubled and trouble the comfortable. In other words, teaching is uh, in part and for some students about making students uneasy, uh, restless, agitated about the state of the world, making them think, ask tough questions about themselves, about their country, about the world in which they're growing up. And I think uh, teaching is also about providing comfort or solace or refuge, right? This is the teacher's challenge, negotiating that balance. I think that we need to push for education policies that enable teachers to negotiate that balance to the best of their possibility, right? That little boy who said, uh, I'll never forget that one, on, one, on that day you held my hand and you didn't let go, he represents the challenge for all teachers face when they enter the classroom. They will affect children's lives in ways both big and small, and they won't always um, know which is which. What I'd like uh, educators to do and what I'd like all of us to do, whether we're uh, advocating for you know, one type of pedagogy or for another, is to ask ourselves this, right? Why do we have schools? Let's go back to those questions that, that um, we ask what parents want for their kids. Um, what is the purpose of schooling and what is the purpose of an education? Um, what are they for and what do we hope to accomplish? Okay? What gifts uh, can we encourage our children to give the world? Yes, they need uh, to study math and they need to develop reading skills, but they need so much more. And while in some schools these uh, policies like EQAO testing um, in Ontario, like the testing regimes here, for some schools they're extremely beneficial as are No Child Left Behind. For others, they're straight jackets. Um, and they, uh, they curtail, if, depending on how they're implemented, 
They curtail teachers' abilities um, to teach critical thinking in a way that is important for democracy. It's easy in that sense to slip into something sad and predictable, right? Teachers' lives can easily be full of um, bided time, waiting for retirement, quietly fulfilling the smallest duties. Um, but classrooms can also burn with the passion to make the world a little better for each decade, uh, big and small. One of my favorite poets I'm going to close with, Mary Oliver, says this really artfully. In the conclusion to her poem, The Summer Day, she, Oliver asks us this, tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? That's, I think, a question we can all carry with us every day as we fight for meaningful school reform and learning in our schools. And even as those of you who are attending this conference um, about the latest and greatest in assessment strategies and, and so forth, that's the question we can always ask ourselves. What is it each of us plan to do with our one wild and precious life? Thank you.